And we're quite definitely recording and I'm very, very happy to be here and to welcome a lovely man for a special episode of the Brand Strand version of the Good Listening To podcast. This is the lovely Johan Ilgenfritz. That's quite a beautiful name, which we love you for already. And he is the founder member of UK Health Radio. And what's your current listenership? Not to sort of allow you to boast off the get go, but Johan, what, what's the listenership currently? Uh, hi, lovely speaking with you, Chris. You too. <laughs> um, yeah, UK Health Radio's uh, listenership at the moment is um, 1.2 million. And, that is. and bless you for that, because my our good friend Reg told me that it had humble beginnings where you might have had one DJ and maybe a sort of stoat and a tortoise listening to it. Whereas now you have this glorious empire, which is really about the whole holistic approach to to health in all aspects, which I, I'll get you on the open road of talking about in a few moments. Uh, but it's my great pleasure to welcome you to The Clearing, where we're going to wrap this episode around the, the wonderment of you, but also UK Health Radio and everything you've created. And um, I'm also very humbled to be in your company from the point of view of, I hope I do you service in that or justice rather, because Reg, um, in, in the preparation we've been doing, and I have been sort of toing and froing about how I can position you, but your story, your narrative, your journey to now is rich in texture and tapestry indeed and so I'm really interested to talk about uh, tennis because of the slightly awkward thing that happened in that and I love tennis <laughs> there's the Angolan war there's recovery of your own profound existential threat of illness so you've, you've just got a really interesting story so ladies and gentlemen please welcome to the GLT clearing Johan Ilgenfritz Woohoo! <laughs> hurrah so um how's morale how are you today Johan I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, great day. Uh, every day is a is a great day for me. I have to admit, I love it. I love what I do. Um, I, f I, I don't crawl out of bed. I get up, I bounce out of bed at four o'clock in the morning and um, can't wait to to just to just to get going with UK Health Radio and to see it. You mentioned um, humble beginnings. The first three months, um, Chris, we had two listeners and I was one of them. <laughs> I think my wife was the other one. She's never admitted to it, but I'm, I'm almost positive she was the other one. And you know what? I share your humble beginnings. I think it could just be you and me that are listening to this podcast at the moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and my wife, interestingly, isn't one of them at the moment because she's in the background doing something else which he thinks at this moment is far more important, obviously. So yes, humble beginnings, I share that. So um, I also know, yes, you love to bounce out of bed because I've been told that you run 10K a day to this day. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, well, it's not It's not um, every day, every second day I do. I do between 10 and 12Ks. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, 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 it plays, it's become such a big part of, of my daily routine. And I absolutely love it. And it's my time. It's only for me. You know, it's it's I, I, I don't even listen to music when I run. It's um, it's my time to 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 dream, to create, to or just run, depending on how I feel that day. You know, I love the carpe diem, just profound positivity and and life force that you're transmitting already through that. And um, so that's a perfect segue into, uh, first of all, the clearing within the Good Listening To podcast. Um, just before we uh, get to the clearing, because it could well be about your running state, could be your clearing. It doesn't have to be that. But that's what I'm beginning to hear. Um, your journey to now, what brought you to, to UK Health Radio? What was the sort of genesis point and what got you there? Oh, it's... Um, I, um... It's actually, I'm not a health professional at all. Um, I used to be a fashion photographer. I worked as a fashion photographer for 20, almost 25 years. Um, both in, um, started, of course, studied photography in South Africa, and then uh, immigrated to Germany, worked there, um, had a, an agent here in London as well. So I will, in the end, I was working in Hamburg and in, in, in London. So this is a photographic agent you're describing. That's a photographic yep. agent, correct. Yep. Um, so I was working in the two cities. And then um, in, in 2011, um, February, uh, I first had a heart attack on the tennis court. You mentioned that already. <laughs> um, and then a couple of months later, in June, uh, 
you know, the doctors kept on saying to me, you should be feeling better. You should be getting better. And I wasn't. Hey? And in June of 2011, I was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, oh, so, so there are two in incredible occurrences there. So, so first of all, just to backtrack you slightly, on the tennis court, um, were you winning? Who were you playing? I love tennis. So I, I, I was intrigued by that part of your story. So what was happening um, yeah. what was that day? And myself, Chris, um, my sister was a very, very good tennis player. She played mixed doubles with the likes of Johan Crick and those people in those days. Wow. Um, yes, I was. Uh, we were we, play, we were playing a, a league match, and I was playing against a medical doctor, <laughs> Evans, <laughs> and uh, yes, had the heart attack. They um, wasn't winning at the time, but I had I I worked out a plan. <laughs> you had it. The, the medical doctor, just talk us through that story, because obviously that's that's what an extraordinary bit of synergy that is, that you're playing a medical doctor at yeah. the time of your heart attack. Yeah, definitely. It was, it really was. It was, um, uh, I, I cannot remember too much of it, but he was there. Um, he, he just sprang into action. He knew exactly what to do. Um, the, the actual club where we were playing were like totally... Um, equipped for any medical situation. Um, I woke up uh, about an hour later in the hospital. Uh, he was with me, the doctor, uh, my opponent came with me. And I'm actually, it's not that we're best friends, but we still keep in touch, funnily enough. I, I'm not surprised. He's a sort of um, a daemon, a demon or a sort of soul guide to you, I'm sure, because of the fact he was there at an extraordinary moment in your life. Yeah. Yeah, it, it it really was. It was. Uh, it well. It was actually the first time that I was forty-six at the time. So I'm it was. It, it, it was the first time, totally unexpected as well, that I was actually really ill. You know, yes. I'm not talking about colds and stuff, but like really, really ill. It was. You know, so seriously, um, seriously ill. So. so it was the first time, I suppose, that you profoundly contemplated your own mortality. I'm assuming. No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not at that stage. At that stage, it was, um, it was literally okay. Done that. Um, get back. To, get back to the to fitness um, and get back onto the tennis court as soon as possible. That, that was the, the mindset, you know, bulletproof, uh, etc. Um, yeah, just also, and the other thing was get back to 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 health. To carry on working i was a freelance photographer i didn't work for anybody so uh, no work no man no fun as they say you know so um that was that was the main goal get get back to health and carry on with life and just to continue your story you said the doctors were saying you're not getting better fast enough or something and then there was a sort of move towards the next diagnosis later you're describing yeah it, it was weird because everybody was saying to me okay so the heart attacks three months ago and four months ago and and you should be feeling better but i wasn't I, I just had no energy no nothing you know just i just wasn't getting there um i mean i had no experience but everybody was telling me you should be in a different place already and um and that's when when um, they discovered that i i uh, the first time i i've i i break it down into two because i um I was diagnosed the first time in 2011 and um, I did um, two sets of radiotherapy immediately, I immediately went into that. And then I was cancer free for, for, a, for a little bit. And then um, in 2012, I was diagnosed again with, with cancer. Wow. So, so I suppose the, the doctors focus on you, even the heart attack is part of that journey. So it's extraordinary that sometimes things happen for a reason. I, I, yeah, I, I actually look at it that way um, now, especially, you know, um, I, I think if, if it, if it wasn't that I was under the magnifying glass, if I could call it that, or under observation, it might have um, taken longer for it to become apparent. Yes, we know with cancer, the longer it goes undetected, the, the, the more dangerous it is, you know. So. And I'm, I'm very struck with how when we look back on adversity, when we reflect back, you can see the grace of what was incredibly challenging at the time, but you see the grace and the virtue in the story. You do, yes, definitely. I, I, was, I was once asked 
um, and this was uh, this was in an interview, a radio interview that I did with a, with a, a station in in the states. I was they actually asked me if I was grateful to cancer. Mm-hmm. That stage, I still had it. It was it was on the on the on the on its way out, but I still had it, and it it caught me a little under unaware. I have to admit, I didn't quite know how to answer it. But when I look back now. I won't say grateful, but it it put me on a life trajectory that yes, that has that has fulfilled me, if I could put it that way. Absolutely, and yeah. yes, and I'm intrigued in all of our paths in what's called the journey to now. So, bringing you into the clearing of where you now find yourself within UK Health Radio, how did those two happenstances lead you to the path and the clearing of UK Health Radio? Well, um, as, as I mentioned before, um, after the, f- the first diagnosis, um, I, I just want to mention this because it's, it's a, it, it plays a very significant part in my life. Um, the, the first time I was, a, I was diagnosed, I was really, I was, I was useless. I was in such a tizz. I was in such a frenzy. I couldn't think properly. I, I was just, as I said, useless. <laughs> um, immediately, as I said, went into radiotherapy in the end of two sets of it. And uh, do you think this, if I may, I, sorry to interrupt you, was that a mindset overwhelm you had? When you say you're useless, do you just mean you had no energy or you were panicking or overwhelmed? No, or what was I was happening? panicking. It was, it, was a, it was a mental state. Um, yep. It was the only thing I can really say that I that I took from that first diagnosis and the treatment was the feeling of almost um, helplessness because uh, I had um, I had no duty. I had that after the after the the, the, the the treatment, and when I was when I was given the cancer free, I still had that feeling of I had no duty. Nobody asked me to do anything. Right. They didn't tell me to go on a specific diet. They, you know, they, I, all I had to do was be there for the treatments. So what we're and getting on, to... what we're getting onto beautifully here is that what brings you out of yourself is the idea of purpose and duty. Because I'm assuming that you feel a real soul connect and soul chime, if you can call it that, uh, to what you're now doing, because it's a sense of serving and a sense of duty. Well, definitely. I, I just, I just felt left out of the loop <laughs> and, and i thought and i kept on thinking but this is my health why why don't i why why isn't there anything i can do yes you know i wasn't i wasn't blaming anybody nothing like that it was just i had this that's what i mean by helplessness i had this yeah. feeling of i'm not contributing to getting me well getting me better me yes. going to for the treatment isn't me partaking in it so and that was, that's, and, and that feeling um, stayed with me. But unfortunately, you know what it's like. You get better and nothing else, nothing changes. Mm-hmm. Until February of the next year of 2012, where um, I, I actually, it was actually during my first post-cancer checkup, um, my oncologist said to me, I'm really sorry, sorry Johan, but the cancer is back. It's it's spread everywhere, and um, we literally have maximum of twelve months to live. Good grief! So this is twenty twelve. You were given that diagnosis. February, end, of, end of February was was actually on my wife's birthday on the twenty fifth of February. <laughs> Yeah. And so it's so, so, so lovely with you sitting here, obviously do the math sort of nine years later with an extraordinary force of life and purpose and, and you know, the alchemy and goal we're going to talk about later that you're bringing. Beautiful. So sorry, yeah. back to your story. No, no, not at all. The, the, the thing, the, the difference between the first and the second night diagnosis was me because I can remember sitting in that chair, looking at her um, lovely, lovely lady, um, my doctor in, in Germany. This was still in Germany. Um, and, and hearing in the back of my head a voice saying, not going to happen. You are not going to die in 12 months time or before. And that, and, and that, actually, that was actually quite inspiring because the, the, the difference in reaction within me was so... <laughs> 
because 180 degrees apart, you know. And if I may, what's intriguing is you said that in the third person as if somebody else, your inner genius is telling you, some, some other entity or force or connection is saying you're not going to die rather than I'm not going to die. It, it really was because, she, I, and I can still recall the conversation, her speaking and while she's speaking and me listening, hearing this voice in the back of my head, um, actually uh, screaming at me, it's not going to happen. Oh, you know, it's, it, it was, it's, it's actually wonderful. I think about it quite often, actually. And but if not, I may. I mean, not in a negative way either, you know, in a, actually in a, in a quite, quite an enlightened way. And if I may, uh, excuse this question, but what do you attribute that voice to? Is it just your complete inner being in the third person or do you attribute it to a sort of higher self? Um, I, I don't know. I think it, I think perhaps a little bit of, of both. I think that uh, that feeling I had within me of not contributing, that's sort of manifested as well within me that, come on, you've, you know, you, it's, it's your health. Do You've got to be part of it. Um, yeah, that's that's what I contributed to, actually. It's, it's a very uh, prof profound awakening, sort of 46 years into your life, when suddenly everything gear, everything changed direction. But that's almost like the awakening part of your life since when you've been more alive than ever, it would seem. Yes, it definitely, as I say, put my whole life on a different trajectory, completely. I mean, I, um, I was of the mindset that um, the doctor is there to look after your health and all that. And, and that is completely different now. I have a total different, um, I'd never heard of lifestyle um, changes that can be done to improve or, or better health. I'd never heard of integrated health or anything like that, you know? So, and, and, and I mean, that's all changed now. That all, it, it just, I, I think about this so often, Mark Twain, uh, has this wonderful saying. He, uh, he said that there, there are two important days in every person's life: the day you're born and the day you find out why. Wow! And and that is really what happened to me. <laughs> I love being a fashion photographer. I mean, it was it was exhilarating, especially when you're a young man with, with traveling and and beautiful people that you work with and everything. It's not the most pleasant and nice um, awakening world, world yeah. out there let's face it uh, yes. and the older you get uh, the more tedious it does get but, yes. um, but that as I say I, I, I explain it like this quite often like quite often um, people say oh yes but, but your health issues I don't see them as health issues they were but they've actually become um, a a new life for me because it did it changed my whole life and, and thank you for sharing the delicious mark twain quote so if i may it's almost like you can name the day you found out why is has it got a date specifically attached to it when is the date in your life that you found out why well i i, I actually said the 25th of february because that was the beginning that was a light went on on in my head and that That's was the 25th of february 2012 is that 2012, right 12 correct um, the, the day they told me that you have 12 months to live it was the beginning of my new life <laughs> because it, it was the beginning of, of this world that I live in now. I'm just letting that hang there. That's a, that's a beautiful sort of end of that particular part and a lovely segue. So we're listening to the Good Listening To podcast with Johan Ilgenfritz. When I first heard your name, I thought German. Then I thought white South African when I first heard your voice, when I first spoke to you, um, Afrikaans. But so what's the derivation of Ilgenfritz? It's such a beautiful name. It is, yes. It's, um, um, I am German um, and it's, uh, it's, we come from a, a little town in the south of Germany called Rotenburg of the Tauber. And if you're, if you're a Japanese tourist, you've definitely been there. <laughs> Have I? Okay, tell me why. <laughs> because it's, this, it's this really quaint medieval city and it still looks like it's still got the wall around it and the moat. Ah. And, everything. It's, and they've, it, it's preserved. It's, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. The, but all the, all the restaurants, all the hotels, the menus are all in, in German, English and, and Japanese. So. <laughs>
But Just say, uh, say the name of the town again. Rottenburg ob der Tauber. Beautiful. Rottenburg yeah. ob der Tauber, if I said that correctly. Yeah. <laughs> do you still have family connections there? I do. I have, I have a cousin there who's actually the brewmaster of Rottenburg. He has a, a um, he runs the the brewery and uh, it's it's quite something. It's quite something going out with him. That is quite a connection, if I may, Johan, to have, <laughs> you know, the brewmaster of yeah. that awesome town. Um, yeah. Yes, I'll be take, bringing you up some numbers later on. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So if I may, I'm going to take you through the usual construct um, of the path of storytelling metaphors within the Good Listening To podcast. So we've, we've stumbled on to all sorts of lovely resonances of alchemy and gold already. But first of all, if I can just ask you, bringing you into the clearing, what is a clearing with your wonderful life experience to this point, where do you go? Where does Johan go to get clutter-free, inspirational, and able to think? What is a clearing like for you? Um, my clearing is not a physical place. My clearing is um, meditation and running. I um, I get so much out of those two things and I can do them wherever I am in whatever state of mind I am um, I can go there so um, I'd as I mentioned before I'd never of course I'd heard of meditation but I'd never even contemplated meditating um, before 2011 let's just put it that way you know, and you weren't not active either because you played tennis obviously that's when it happened so were you a runner before then or did you discover running post I've, I've, 2011? I've, I've always been a very sporty person i've always loved sports um i did um i did karate for for nine years as as a as a as a young as a teenager and a, and a young man um, i've always played tennis i grew up on the tennis my sister's older so i was always tagged with you know how it how it is so and I, lo I love the sport. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not exceptionally good at it, but I absolutely adore it, you know, so. And, and if I may, someday I would love to play you because tennis has been the saviour of me and my wonderful ability to connect to my son, who I'm being beautifully connected to anyway. But tennis during the pandemic has just got away from the sort of slight mindset of the you know the, the the sort of existential threat of the pandemic and everything it brought with it to changes it tennis has just been this wonderful way of externalizing from my head and physically sort of twonking something which has been really therapeutic <laughs> yes oh i definitely i can imagine and i love ping pong for the same reason partly the ping pong of conversation you know it's in my sort of dna to want to to and fro a bit i think yeah yeah, I love, uh, playing, I love playing table tennis as well, I have to. <laughs> wonderful. So um, if I may, I'm going to join you then. I mean, when you go running, are you meditating with, with something in your ears, playing music, or are you just in your own peaceful mind? What, what's happening? Yeah, um, the, for me, they're two separate things. The meditating I do at home. Um, I have a spot at home, actually just in our bedroom. It's not a, it's not a you know, a lot of people have, have like thrones and all kinds of things. I, I just, I have a, a spot next to our bed i have a lovely cushion that i sit on and that's where i meditate and the running part of it is where i i i never run with anybody and i never run with music it's my time and i'm really really very almost jealous of that time it's purely my time i create in that time i um, do mantras in that time and sometimes I just run. Depends on how I feel. Uh, depends on what I need to do in what frame of mind I am. But it, it's it's really become quite apparent. And and I'm actually quite sorry sometimes when it's over, if that makes any sense. <laughs> That's such a, a beautiful description. And indeed, um, I feel slightly intrusive in that I'm going to ask your permission very you know cheekily if i can join you in that meditative place because i want to bring you into the clearing with a tree yeah. so so i'll keep out the way because i'm getting this is your sanctuary but what we're going to move on to now is a tree where we're going to shake your tree to see which storytelling apples fall out and the apples take the form of this uh, storytelling exercise which i told you about before where you've had five minutes to have thought about four things that have shaped you three things that inspire you, 
Two things that never fail. Whoop, squirrels to get your attention. <laughs> that's borrowed from the film Up, by the way, the dog that's distracted by squirrels. And then one quirky or unusual fact about you, Johan Ilgen Fritz, we couldn't possibly know until you tell us. Um, this is your time to shake your tree. I, I, I completely hear that you need to be alone and private and it's, san it's, san it's sanctuary to you. So I'm going to be very much in the background, not shaking your tree for you. But, but just go where you like with, with shaking... How do you like them apples? Shake the apple stories out of the tree and, and go where you like. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, four things that shaped me. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely. My dad. My father was um, the biggest, strongest man you've ever seen in your whole life. I used to call him a squarehead German. <laughs> <laughs> And he used to call me Kastenkopf, which in German means square head. <laughs> <laughs> Say the word again. Um, Kastenkopf. Kastenkopf. Yeah, it's just a, it was just a little word play that we had, you know. It's just um, my dad definitely, definitely shaped me in many ways. My father left school at sixteen, and he finished his career as 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 a professional engineer and one of the top managers in um, the ISCO steel, uh, the South African um, steel industry. Um, he found his passion um, as an apprentice and just worked himself up um, into the position that he was uh, when, when, he, when he went into retirement. He, he, was, he, was, he was a hunter, but the, kind of, but the kind of hunter, the kind of man that didn't force his son to become a hunter. I, um, I, I distinctly remember um, I went hunting with, with my, my father and one of his uh, friends one day. And I was driving, I was a teenager, 15, 16. And um, he gave me the job of driving in the fells, in the bush. It's not bush really, it's just, it was just felt, um, the Land Rover and they were on the back standing up doing the hunting and um they shot and we pulled up and, they, and we followed the the deer for a while and um not far it was a really good shot and we pulled up and the deer was lying there and, my, and they everybody jumped off the land rover and you know went to there and my dad said come you have, come and have a look and i i couldn't i looked at the animal and i thought i can't i can't i can't go near it you know and my, my father didn't, in front of his friends, say, oh, come on, be a man, you know, nothing, nothing like that. He just said, no, that's fine. You stay in the car. Um, it's all okay. And, the, and they went about their business. So that's the kind of dad my father was. As I said, a strong so, no, And no judgment. I, I adore that. What a profound man. And if I may, he sounds like your superhero, your man of steel, literally yes. and metaphorically. And yeah. um, is he still with us? I'm, you're talking about him in the past tense. I'm assuming not, but no, he's not. Um, my, my father, my father died um, 19 years ago, a long, long, long time ago. Actually, um, and I think about him so often, not in a sad way or anything like that. But I actually would love to have him here with me now, that I could show him, I could tell him, I could speak with him. You know, I do speak with him all the time, but but just. Yeah, in person and say to him. You know, uh, I, I just adore how you're playing his spirit forward with the quality of steel. You know, steel, but with warmth is what you bring in, in spades. And your dad sounds like a very warm, close to the sort of furnace of the steel, but a man of steel. Yeah. And, and you had such steel to pull yourself to this point, which is really clear. So thank you for telling me about your dad. That sounds a real privilege. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, as I said, he was a great man. And, and um Unfortunately, I, I was still, I was a young man. I was thirty when he died, but 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 older than that when when my father passed. So um, didn't appreciate exactly what I had at that stage. I think you know, come to appreciate it more now, and that's why I would love would love just to have one conversation with him. Oh. That would be awesome. And again, when you look back with hindsight, you see it with grace and you just want to... I mean, so what would, you, what, would, what would you like to say to him if he was here? I, no, just nothing spe specific. I would like to show him UK Health Radio, of course. I'd like to show him what I've created and everything. But, but just a conversation, just 
me and him chatting about whatever came up, you know, just, uh, that's it. Just, I can remember what he smelled like and everything. It's like, so that it's, 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 um, th that's what I mean. Just, just that, I think it's just the intimacy, just him sitting there and just having that, that one-to-one -one conversation would, would be wonderful. If I may, just I want to say the word perfect. That was the most that's the most perfectly formed first apple to fall out of the storytelling tree I've experienced so far. Thank you. Back to you. Um, I think the second part was uh, was my karate. I did. Um, I I was um, unlike my father. I was a very small, skinny, thin um, young boy. <laughs> Nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not small anymore, but the rest has stayed the same. Um, and it was, I, I, I absolutely adored karate. It was a great throw. Um, it was done in weight, so I, I wasn't having to, having to compete against people, even in my own age, because they were all bigger than me and they were all stronger and, you know, and and more muscular and stuff like that for me but it just and it and it, it 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 just put me in such a a a lovely frame of mind knowing that knowing that you can defend yourself just puts you in a whole total different place you know and it and karate yeah karate definitely um it taught me a lot of discipline do you still practice it to this day I don't. I, I still practice some of the carters. I don't know if, if you are, are aware of the carters are those movements that you do. They all, they, you know, it, it's a specific form of movement that you do. It's, it's all part of muscle memory and stuff like that, that you train. Akin, um, I suppose, to Tai Chi and the very specific repertoire of moves that you do. Uh, Absolutely, and, yeah. and sequence and how they follow on each other and stuff. I still remember, not all of them, I have to admit, I still remember a few of them though, and I like doing it. And I, I, I actually use some of those movements to warm up before I go and run. So it's a bit of a... And does the karate inform your meditative capability as well? Because obviously Tai Chi, karate, discipline helps with meditation, doesn't it? Yes, it it. it, it actually didn't play that bigger part in 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 the karate i did um, mm. i did funakushi karate which uh, doesn't exist as as that anymore it's amalgamated with a few other styles uh, but it wasn't it wasn't very we well well my club wasn't a very spiritual part the spiritual part of it didn't wasn't really big at all it sure. didn't exist at all it was more of a training what we did do quite often is we used to train um in the woods um close to where the club was there was a golf course as well so they were beautiful it was beautiful you know and we used to go into the woods and and train in in, in, some, in amongst the trees and stuff and that was fun i mean that was the closest we really got to anything spiritual uh, with that. and i love the idea that you're in the woods and every now and again you've got to be aware because you've got a karate chop a golf ball away <laughs> you caught it fantastic <laughs> uh, yeah and it and it, it it definitely taught me um, a lot of discipline, which which has which has helped me during my life a hell of a lot. And what brought you to going to karate? You know that choice of which activities one does. You know how old were you, and, and what what nudged you in the direction of karate? Um, I don't know. It, it just it was just always an interest of me. I did I I didn't do it to to impress my father or anything like that. Um, it was actually, it was my decision. I, I wanted to do it. I, I found it interesting. I found the whole concept of it interesting. I'm, I'm often intrigued by the adage, what's meant for you won't pass you by. So just the choices that we make. And so you went through a doorway of karate. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, a, just a, a, an observation to make. So it's, it's lovely. And, that it, and it was close by and it was, I had two great, I had a husband and wife trainer, trainers that um, she trained me in the beginning. And as I progressed, he took over you know they had the the club was separated into two sections really like um f you know from the belts going upwards and she did the beginning and then he did the the later on training and i'm imagining you being about 14 when you described this but you didn't say what age you were so what age did karate enter your life um i started at the age of nine 
not uh, sorry if you'd said that already if you're yeah. sure so um yeah i i did it I, as i said i did it for about nine years as well so mm. um it was it was great yeah it was really i really enjoyed doing it Lovely. And it is a sport. It, it, I didn't. I didn't do it for the self defense or anything. I did it for the sport. All the the self defense on that was just an added bonus. It was a lovely bonus. You know, so. Lovely. So so far, we've got your father and karate. Yeah. What's next? Um, art school. Uh, art school. To be a photographer in South Africa, you have to study. Um, you have. It's not like. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure what it's like in the UK, but in Germany, it's a, it's an apprenticeship that you do. Um, but the, in, in South Africa, I went to art school uh, at to university and and studied art school and, and studied photography there. That's actually where I met my wife as well, because she was studying design. Um, a bit later, she's she's a, a, a little bit younger than what I am, so I was almost finished when she came in. But... And which city did you go to study art in, having come from that beautiful medieval place in in Germany? First of all, um, oh yeah, the, 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 this is the the town. It's not a city. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> the ugliest town uh, you've ever seen in your whole life. It's a it's a it's it's a steel factory city where 60 okay. 70 percent of everybody that lives in it works in the steel works etc so yes oh, of course we're in south africa not in germany are we at this yes, point yes, yes. This is in south africa now, um, uh, so i got i got um seduced by the romance of germany and your medieval city but i'm in the whole i'm in totally the wrong country <laughs> no so um yes yeah, so and and the university was in this city in uh, it's called funnabel park um which is uh it's, it's close to Johannesburg. It's about 50 minutes drive or 50 kilometers south of Johannesburg. Sure. So. And, and you talked about it being an apprenticeship, which sounds to me like there was a promise of a job at the end of it. Is that correct? So you were studying? Um, um, no, not, not, uh, not the way I studied photography. Um, in Germany, it's an apprenticeship. You go to, you know, that's, uh, but in, in, in South Africa, you go to university and you study art. You, your first year, um, has a bit of photography, a bit of graphic design and everything in it. And then your second, third year, you specialize in whatever you want to do. Yeah. And then you can still do a fourth year as well, which uh, gives you um, a further qualification and stuff like that. And that launched you on a path of being a successful photographer, I'm hearing as well, in, in the tapestry of what you've done in your life. Well, yes, it was. But uh, I think the, the more important part of, of art school was opening my my mind to uh, the actual country I'd lived in for growing up in and the apartheid country, let's call it what, is it, what yeah. it is. And then went to art school and, and was then suddenly confronted. I went to, um, in South Africa, it's called primary school and high school. My high school was almost a military school. It wasn't. It was, you know, it wasn't called a military school, but extreme, extremely, um, yeah, rigid and everything. You know, really, um, let's just call it almost military school. For yeah, and then you go into art school and you have this complete freedom, and all of a sudden there are people challenging ways of thinking, challenging everything. You know. Everything yeah. that you thought normal because you'd grown up in it, you think it's normal. Um, and that, for me, that was, that's why I, I, I added it to this because it definitely shaped uh, my life. It opened my mind to looking at things from, from other people's um, viewpoints. And perspective. That was one yes. of the main things. And not always looking, looking at how I grew up and actually questioning it, whether it was correct or not. Yes. Et cetera, et cetera. So from that point of view, that, that, I, that was really profound, a really profound part of my life. I, uh, I was there for, for four and a half years mm -hmm. and, it, and it, it changed me considerably as well. And I know that you've done military service in your path as well. And there's the Angolan War as part of what you served in was, was what I read about you beforehand. So in terms of timeline, did that come after art school or did it uh, come before? The, the military, um, fortunately or unfortunately, I still don't know, came after uh, art school. Mm -hmm. 
art school. I, I went to study directly after school, and then um, I, I I came to I actually uh, went to Germany after art school. Um, got I had a job there. It didn't work out. So basically, forced to go back to South Africa and was drafted immediately, and then went into into the South African army. And did that feel strange that you've been at art school, all that freedom, all that mind opening, and then you're back to South Africa and then suddenly you're sucked back into a militaristic uh, way of being? The absolute worst. <laughs> a real jolt to your system. Yes. The, there's a saying in South Africa, the best two years of your life you never want again. Well, I changed that. The worst two, lives of, worst two years of your life you never want again. <laughs> the double whammy of it's not good. <laughs> yeah, no, just... The absolute worst after all that freedom and then six months in Germany and then going back into into that tyranny almost if I could call it that was, yes. was one of one of one of the hardest things I've ever done and actually landed me in quite a lot of trouble within the army um, as well which which I don't really want to go into into too much depth but um, just rebelling actually against it and in a in a, in a military um, setting rebelling against rigidness isn't a good thing as if you're con almost like a conscientious objection i'm hearing and by the way we don't have to go anywhere where you don't go because it's your clearing which is lovely so we can surface out of there and go wherever else you want to yeah no it was um the one amazing thing about the army was um one or two people I met there, um, fantastic, fantastic people, people, friends for life. Unfortunately, the one isn't alive anymore, but the other one is. And um, it's, it's, yeah, that's what I look at. That's what I take from it. I and again, it's a lovely example of when you look back, therein lies the grace. So that was a hellish two years. The grace is you met these two individuals as well as everything else you might have taken from it. Yeah. And above all, I found it a waste of my time. I think that was the the hardest thing of it all you know it was just it was just a waste of two years of my life <laughs> and your story by the way is so beautifully steeped in time is precious and yeah. so i completely understand why you would think that <laughs> absolutely yes I, I i did spend um some time in angola as well uh, as a as a because i had studied photographer i was a, a war photographer basically in um uh, in angola and um yeah. So let's come back to your to your apples. Uh, okay. So where do you want to go next? Because uh, you've got art school. I think the, yeah, the fourth the fourth really big thing that shaped my life was cancer. Cats. Can, oh, can cancer. cancer. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, that's so much more profound what you said than I heard. I'm so sure. sorry when you said yeah. cats and you said cancer. I'm sorry. Back to you. Yeah. I mean, we've we've spoken about it. It changed my whole life. It's put yeah. me in this life where I am now. That that I absolutely adore. I absolutely thrive on it, you know, so. Um, and that's so self-evident, by the way, you have, a, you have a glorious energy to you. You've even got beautiful rosy cheeks of invigoration. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, can, yeah, can, can, and, and um, it, it's, it's a bit of a double-sided sword as well, because a lot of people always say, you're cancer. And I stopped them right there because I say to them, it was never my cancer. It is cancer. I mm. never, um, and this is a really important part of it as well. I never gave cancer oxygen. I never called it my cancer. I still to today write it never with a capital letter. I actually sometimes write it with a K just to show my disrespect. <laughs> I, that's so brilliant. Not giving it oxygen is just yeah. such a profound thing to say. And, and the framework of the mindset of that is just sublime. Yeah. It's, and it, and it, I've mentioned it here and then, um, and that's it. I want to move on from the cancer. It's not about the cancer. It's about what, the, what that has brought me now that is shaping my life and that has shaped my life so that's the uh, that's uh, i just wanted to get that out there with the cancer is so many people say my cancer and i'm struggling with this cancer and my and it's absolute nonsense it's not your cancer it's it's a disease it's got nothing to do with you and um you shouldn't even have it 
actually you know if you if you would um if you would look at your i want to i just want to mention this that only five to ten percent of all cancer related illnesses on the planet today is genetically inherited that means 90 to 95 percent is contributed to lifestyle wow of which nutrition and toxic overload are the top two culprits just to put it out there the other thing that that i have is uh, and, I, and i really have it i have uh, my, my mantra is um it's uh it's, it's actually quite controversial but good health is a choice is my mantra and a lot of people say to me how can you say that and of course there are situations where it's not a choice but with the with the with the numbers i've just mentioned with 90 to 95 percent contributed to our lifestyle it almost becomes a choice and i've embraced those choices and i'm here i've seen both my sons grow up uh, my youngest son was was two and the baby was almost three when i was diagnosed the first time he's 11 now and i'm still here my eldest son is is 21 he's studying here in london i'm still here you know it's a, so it is it is a choice and we can all make it ourselves health is a choice is that one of the mantras that's embedded within uk health radio as well in in, in what you're always broadcasting most definitely that it, it really plays a very big part in of, I mean, has, of, it, has it gone so far as being the strap line so what is what would you say is the strap line of uk health radio um we have it's not it, it's actually my strap line yeah um, that i use it's not uk health radios uk health radio we we, we have Real Feel Good Radio, which was very subtle. It's a little more um, not subtle now. It's it's basically uh, the world's number one talk health radio because we are we are the world's number one talk health radio now, and um, and we 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 cover so many different topics of health um, with on within UK health radio and within the magazine, we have a magazine as well, um, Chris, that called health triangle magazine, yep. uh, of which, uh, our, our, our friend Reg is the editor of, and, um, and it's just, it's, it's just, it's become so big. It's become such a, a, a wonderful, it's got the, the most in-depth information on the widest range of topics today. I'm not talking about websites like the NHS or anything like that. I'm yes. talking about independent people now, of course, you know. Um, and we're not against the NHS. We we are there to support the NHS. It's this is not a. A lot of people look at my um, look at at my history, my me getting rid of the cancer through the lifestyle, through becoming um, first a vegetarian and then a vegan, and now I'm an alkaline vegan um, because. I'm sure you're aware of this, but um, you, cancer, this is a, another thing I wanted to mention to you. This is um, during my 12 months of, um, of my allotted 12 months after I was given, uh, told that I have 12 months to live basically. Um, I went on a journey. I started searching. I realized that this is my life. If you don't do anything about this, you are going to die. Mm -hmm. And I started researching. I went home that morning after I was told 12 months. I went home and I started researching. And seven months into my 12 months, and at that stage, I was really, really ill. Uh, just to give you an idea, it took me 20 minutes to walk up two flights of stairs that morning. Wow. So from playing tennis and doing karate to 20 minutes walking up two flights of stairs. Um, but that morning, early that morning, I read a line in the internet that said, cancer cannot survive in an oxygenated alkaline cellular environment. And for me, that was, and that was my lifeline. <laughs> Everything in my head, all the floodlights went on. Everything just knew this was it. And just say that again, because that really is profound. Your lifeline. Tell me about the alkaline again and, and the oxygenation, because I think that's a really important moment. Yeah. Uh, 
the, the, the line I read was cancer cannot survive in an, al in an oxygenated alkaline cellular environment. And this was, was uh, written by a, a Dr. Um, Warburg. He was the German biochemist. Um, and he actually won a Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1931. 31? 1931. Crikey. And that was it. As I said, all the floodlights went on. So it basically boils down that your body has a pH value. And if it's 7.2, it's neutral. If it's under 7.2, it goes acidic, which in turn turns to glucose, which cancer cells feed on, sugar, in other words. Mm -hmm. If it's 7.2 or above 7.2, it's alkaline, and you actually starve cancer cells to death because they have no food. So if I may then, reading between the lines, you always are in pursuance of measuring your pH as being 7.2 or above. Is that correct? Yes, it's part of my daily routine. Of, and how do you do that? Is there a sort of test kit where you know your pH levels are X? Yes, there's a, there's just a, it's a urine test that you do. Okay. It's just one of these little pieces of paper that you dunk, and then it's got the color coding on it and everything. Like, of course, it's not as, as accurate as when you would do it in a hospital or anything like yes. that. It gives you a really, really good idea of where you stand. It's just, it's such profound, simple, but not simplistic advice. That's, that's beautifully positioned. And by the way, I'm really happy that you've, you've said what you've said about why and the UK Health Radio moment. I really wanted to give you a moment in the sunshine about that. Yeah. And you've been incredibly trailblazingly clear in this sequence about that and why you do it and your purpose to serve. And, and I mean, that is, that is how I cured my cancer. And I can say cure because I, I don't sell anything worth it. I'm not a health professional. I, it's, um, I starved the cancer. It took me two and a half years. It was, it's not a quick fix either. Um, it took me two and a half years to get rid of my cancer. And, uh, but it works. You, I basically, I, I alkaline, and I still am an alkaline uh, vegan. Um, and I will be for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not, it, it started with nutrition. Um, but it, it moved on to lifestyle, it moved on to meditation, it moved on to um, handling stress. So, so, so important. Stress can acidify your body to such an extent that um, I, I analyzed my life and I realized that the time pressure of which I had an abundance of as a photographer, I was always under the gun. As a photographer, always, there's always time pressure. Um, was my kryptonite so I, I thought okay with the with the radio I, I probably have as much pressure now as I did as a photographer but I looked at it and I worked out how how I could change it and, and I lengthened my day that's why I mentioned I get up at four o'clock in the morning for a reason yeah so that I can get through my day I can do my self-development I can do my meditation and my sports and my running and the stuff and the work without having that, that feeling of time pressure always in my back. And how many hours sleep do you get a night? Because you sound like you're quite driven in a really, really proactively positive way, but getting up quite early, what time do you go to bed? Um, I, I'm usually in bed by about 10 o'clock, uh -huh. quite early, I know. Um, no, no, but you're still getting seven hours. I, I, well, yeah, f f from, from about 10 to four, I, I get up at quarter to four in the mornings. I joke, I, I say, I now, um, I now get up when, as a photographer, I used to go to bed. <laughs> Not bad, but almost. <laughs> You've in, inverted your life in one snapshot there. Lovely. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, anything else you want to tell us about the, the UK Health Radio while you've got this moment in the sunshine? Um, yes, it's... Uh, we there for you, UK Health Radio... Um, is free of charge you can listen to the radio for nothing you can i promised this right in the beginning when i started uk health radio the, and the reason why i started it was because i i wish i had a platform like uk health radio that i could have gone to and not spent seven months getting sicker and sicker and sicker trying to find something in the internet somewhere you know to help me and that's why the um uk health radio we, at the moment, we have 
28 presenters. Um, we're on air 24 seven. We, uh, we have a digital health magazine, Health Triangle magazine, as I mentioned before, which is a subscription magazine. Um, but we, we're working now on issue um, 87. So it's, it's, it's been around for quite a while. It's, and it's an amazing magazine. It's not that clinical, usual health magazine. People are always saying to me, I'm trying to turn it into a fashion magazine. <laughs> I totally disagree with. Although making health fashionable, I see what you're doing there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 a it's a it's an armchair magazine. It's a lifestyle magazine. It's not a, a normal health magazine. But it's full of only health. And edition eighty seven is coming up. You're saying yes. Because if I may, I think you're even being kind enough to run an advert for the Good Listening To podcast within it. I think yes. I, I could be missing a couple more, but it's all good. No, well, we are. Yeah. So back to, uh, and thank you so much for that, um, back to, we're on to three things that inspire you now. And by the way, you're giving me this in spades anyway, so don't worry if there's some overlap. Yeah. So back to shaking your tree, three things that inspire you, please, Johan. Okay, this is a tricky one because there's an over, there's a, there's a overall heading, and that's people. People inspire me. People... <laughs> And not necessarily what they've achieved, but what they've had to change to get where they've been. That that really tickles my fancy. That that really gets me going. Um, you know, so I love that turn of phrase. Tickles my fancy. That really appeals to me. Thank you. It's, it's, it's just <laughs> that I I really I really I love I love listening to people that that have had not necessarily adversities but but that have actually gone within and looked at themselves the people that don't lie to themselves people that look at their behaviors dysfunctional behaviors dysfunctional beliefs um, like i did when i was at art school with the whole um the apartheid thing you know i looked at it and i and i thought to myself this is not right. Yes. This, and I and my my wife and myself actually left the apartheid regime and went back to Germany. That mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know. So um, that's what inspires me in people. People that actually go within. You know the saying: if you don't go within, you will go without. Absolutely uh, beautiful, and it's it chimes so well with my own absolute belief that you know self awareness is the holy grail, and emotional intelligence is is so profoundly important. Yeah. It it, re it really is. I mean it's the only person we can't lie to is ourselves. <laughs> yeah, and if, if, to, in order to lead from without, you need to lead from within, and I love that. Yeah, and you didn't say exactly that, but I'm just reframing it slightly, and how I also then I, I completely anchor to that methodology and mindset as well. Yeah. So, it, as I said, it's a bit of an overlap. I don't have three distinct things there, but th that that I've just mentioned, um, lovely. Is what inspires me: people that not only what they've achieved, but what they've had to change to achieve, to uh, to become what they are. I love that. I love. And by the way, if I may, you're a trailblazer in that regard yourself because of the story you've been telling us about the reframing of your whole existence based on the hiccup as began and the fact you, you know, the Mark Twain quote, just to reincorporate, the day you knew why was 2011. Yes. So lovely uh, in, in the, the February date. Um, so um, two things that whoop squirrels never fail to grab your attention. Yes. Um, the first one is definitely Raphael and my wife. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> she still is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, that's so, Johan, that's lovely. <laughs> and from without as from within. She, I mean, she followed me. She supported me. She joined me on this whole thing I'm on. I'm in, you know, from, from, from the photography, from leaving South Africa, going to Germany, working as a photographer, then the illness, then and now even moving from Hamburg, Germany four and a half years ago to London. Um, she's, she never fails to amaze me. Never ever. <laughs> 
wonderful. What a, what a beautiful moment in the sunshine for her. I love that. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, as I said, she's, um, she's quite something. She really is. She's, um, she also, she, she's the designer. She designs our magazine um, as well. So I think that, as I mentioned before, I met her at art school and uh, we've not, not all the time, almost been together since then. So we've been married for almost 29 years now. And yeah, she she still grabs my attention on a daily basis. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I just want to let that hang there for a moment. Beautiful. Next thing, squirrels that grabs your attention. Yeah, uh, this is this is. I hope you don't judge me for this. <laughs> Good manners. I, I really won't judge you. I I, I agree. <laughs> I, I absolutely for good manners. It's, I don't know, I, I've, when I was young, if you didn't have good manners, it showed. I have the feeling that in today's life, if you have good manners, it shows. It's changed somehow. Um, I just, I love, I love people with good manners, that are nice to people, that speak to people properly, that open the door for ladies that it's just it really it, it and it excites me as well and I love it I just it's and it and I'm drawn to it like a magnet I pick it up like a magnet <laughs> and there's a delicious inherent ad admiration of respect in there so I thank you good manners perfect and now one quirky or unusual fact about you we couldn't possibly know until you tell us yeah, this is this this is um, this nobody knows, actually. Uh, but I and I and I want to I want to mention it in in a way that um, I don't want it to sound I, I don't want to sound obnoxious or anything. I am the guardian of mankind's health and wellness. Um, say that once again. The, the sound dropped out just at the punchline of that. Say it one more time. I am the guardian. I feel as if I should be, and I am, the guardian of mankind's health and wellness. <clears throat> it's, um, I think that's the bottom line that I've never said anywhere to anyone in public or anything like that. But that is, amongst all the other amazing quotes and stuff that I've mentioned that, that aren't from me, most of them are from, as I said, Mark Twain's and these, these brilliant people. Um, but that is my core essence. That is what drives me. And did you just say, if I may, that you've never said that out loud publicly before, you know, as a statement? Yes. And by the way, that's a real privilege because I'm, I'm aware that I'm recording you while you've said this. And that's just a really lovely thing to just float in the water in place there. Yeah. And I love the rule of three, by the way. Just say it one more time because it's such a beautiful mantra of purpose and why. The guardian of mankind's health and wellness. I feel that's why I have been put on, on this earth. That's why... I had the heart attack, I had the cancer and everything else, so that I can, could and can create UK Health Radio. And my goal for UK Health Radio is to put it into every dwelling on the planet. I'm not talking villa, I'm not talking city apartments, family homes, I'm talking dwelling in, on this planet of ours. I want UK Health Radio to be a household name in it and that that is fueled by i am the guardian of mankind's health and wellness and i i profoundly hope wish and desire that your dream and vision comes true in that what a, what a really wonderful generous reason for being that is it's it's such a profound purpose as a beautiful segue by the way into moving away from the beautifully shaken tree and the storytelling apples you've just shared with us. We're still in your clearing now. 
Uh, because of your privacy within your clearing, I'm still metaphorically uh, letting you just weave your magic within it. Um, but we're going to talk about alchemy and gold, which, again, you've been inferring all the way through. But when you are at purpose and in flow, Johan Ilgenfritz, the alchemy and the gold that you're here to bring, you've just given a brilliant example of that. But what, what's alchemy and gold for you, the purpose? Oh, um, yeah, but basically what I've just said, that is my, my purpose in life now, is to, is to create something that anybody or anywhere in the world can access, whether they have medical services or not, that they can access free of charge, listen to. And I, ch I chose radio. A lot of people quite, uh, ask me quite often, why, why radio? And I, it's because I find radio is probably the most, if you do it properly, the most, um, uh, what is the word? It's certainly soothing, uh, I'm hearing. Yes. And it, reassuring. That as well. But the, the most intimate form of communication outside of speaking to somebody in person, of course, um, there is. Because if you do radio correctly, you each and every person, whether they're sitting in a group or if they're sitting by themselves, it would sound, it can sound as if whoever's on the radio is speaking to you personally. Yes. And that, and that is, and, and there's another, there's another one that I want to mention, and this is just a bit of fun as well, that um, the other reason why I chose radio was in Hamburg, Germany, the main station in Hamburg has a jingle and translated into English, it says, um, radio goes in your ear and the message stays in your head. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Radio goes in your ear, but the message stays in your head. I love that. <laughs> and that's, and yeah, I just, I just always add that in, but it's, um, that's, I mean, that, that is my alchemy and that is, is my goal in life is to put UK Health Radio into every dwelling. On the and if I may, it's also the diamonds beneath your feet is, what your mission is with UK Health Radio and your beautiful magazine as well. Beautiful. Uh, and not only mine, you, you, you mustn't forget this. There's one thing I have to have to mention is um, Janie Lee Grace gave me a name and she, she calls me and, and it's caught on, um, the curator of health expertise. And that's exactly what I do. This is not my wisdom I'm spreading. I have 28 of the most amazing presenters, all health professionals, all practitioners that are, that are actually doing this with me, for me, for everybody. This is not me. UK Health Radio is not me. UK Health Radio are these people, these, these amazing beings that are on the same path as what I, what I am, delivering this life-changing information to whoever wants to listen the word curator in there as well as being the guardian is just so beautiful and attuned to your to your purpose and way of being awesome and now uh, johan elgenfritz we're going to award you with a cake for gracing us and, and giving us the privilege of our time here in the good listening to podcast clearing and the cake is another final metaphor where we're going to put a cherry on the cake and your opportunity to give us your cherry on the cake is open to interpretation could be the best piece of advice you've ever been given it could be notes that you might give to your younger self or uh, linked to all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players we can even put the cherry on the cake of your legacy how you'd most like to be remembered Again, it's over to you. Here's your cake. Would you please now give us your cherry? Yeah. First of all, it's not one cherry. It's limitless cherries. Secondly, um, there are, there's one or two quotes. They're also not from me, but um, there's a quote that's, that served me really well in my life. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. This was especially apparent with cancer because it, it helped me in a mind shift that took me from uh, believing that cancer was the cause of my illness to realizing that it was merely a symptom of, of a sick body. And then cause and effect came in. You change the cause, you can change the effect. 
which is a natural law. And so that is really profound for me. That is, um, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Looking at things from other people, from other perspectives is so important in life. Um, that's one of the things that's helped me a tremendous amount. Uh, what else? I think that's, I think that's it. <laughs> I love that. It's a beautiful cherry and it's made up of multiple cherries. I get that. Wonderful. So, uh, Johan Ilgenfritz, thank you so much for taking the time to join us here in the Good Listening To podcast clearing. Is there anything else that you'd like to say as a, a, in the clearing whilst we've got you in the sunshine? Yes, it's just been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, Chris. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this tremendously. Um, to everybody listening, become part of your health. Be part of the system. Don't take your health into your own hands. That's not what I'm saying at all. But be part of, of either keeping or retaining or gaining your health freedom. Because it is a freedom that we don't realize we have until we don't have it anymore. And uh, yeah, and that's it. And and be nice to each other, be, <laughs> help each other. And just um, thank you so much for speaking with me. So you have been listening to me, Chris Grimes and Johan Ilgenfritz of UK Health Radio in the Good Listening To podcast clearing and good night. <laughs>